So we're starting here with Facebook. This, of course, is a big deal. They're really talking about breaking up Facebook this time. Maybe it's really going to happen. Um, it's kind of good that they started with Facebook because Facebook seems to be the one that everybody agrees to hate. And anyway, um, so they're really talking about removing from Facebook um, their big acquisitions, uh, WhatsApp and Instagram. Uh, the technical problem, of course, is those were already approved by the government years ago. So Facebook's argument is, wait a minute, you can't change your mind after approving it. And the government's argument is, well, they didn't technically approve it. They just technically didn't complain about it at the time. And so we'll see where that goes. But anyway, um, for background, I thought this is pretty good. There are so many damning things about Facebook. And here's one from about a year ago where they totally explained how if you play ball with them, they will let you see all the user data of your customers and exploit them. And if you don't, they'll hide it from you. And, you know, they totally been using this. This is one of the many things incredibly unethical that, that Zuckerberg totally admitted doing and got caught doing. Um, the other one I remember years ago that really caught my attention is he said, well, I just altered the Facebook login, so you have to try three times. So as people try all their passwords, I'll get their passwords. And I used that to get the passwords of journalists that were writing about it. And I logged it into their, their email to see like, what they were going to write about us. And he just totally admitted this. <laughs> so, I mean, he's, he's famous for just being totally unethical all the way through and over and over betraying the privacy of their users. So anyway, everybody pretty much agrees to hate Facebook these days. Even the right wing hates Facebook because they think they're filtering too much right wing news. So anyway, we'll see what comes of it. It may yeah, be a that, big, yeah. That's the big question is, will they actually do something about it? Is that, that is a, a valid point of, they didn't stop them earlier when they could have. Well, this seems to be one of the very few things that the right and the left both agree on, is let's both get together and beat up Facebook. <laughs> But I would have thought they would have agreed on the Corona stimulus bill, but apparently not. So who knows? <laughs> but anyway, if that happens, of course, after next in line will be Google and then Apple and then Microsoft. Uh, so, you know, it might be a big breaking up of tech companies. And I don't know how, if that'll get too far. But, but Facebook is sort of the canary in the coal mine for the rest of them. Anyway, there were a couple links about the FireEye breach. Of course, this was big news. Yeah, so um, I thought this was pretty interesting, um, especially this this first um, article. I mean, they're both the, the they both have, this this is the more in depth article. So uh, the other one was just the first one that I found um, in the earlier report. Um, this just came out yesterday, but it has a really good analysis. Um, surprisingly, it has a really good analysis uh, of the whole uh, scenario and. Uh, the salient points to me that were very interesting about this were um, uh, one, it's it's most likely um, it's most likely Russia. No big surprise there. Uh, but what's surprising is that the first off, the the only thing they stole were essentially internal tools that were nothing crazy. They were like. Uh, Stuff like Metasploit, essentially, that, that FireEye had built uh, to use um, internally on pen tests and engagements and stuff. And they're like, you know, none of, this, none of this is particularly advanced or groundbreaking stuff that they stole. But to steal it, they used, uh, and I couldn't find too much in, in terms of the, the nuts and bolts of this, but they used apparently some kind of super novel uh, attack. Uh, to carry this out. And that's what, what was very interesting to me. Um, and, and they also mentioned in here that it's bizarre that they would uh, put such so much time, so such great time and resources into um, developing uh, whatever attack methods that they use to uh, affect this compromise only to steal like script kitty tools, essentially. And um, I thought that was pretty interesting. And, and one, one speculation in there was that uh, maybe they were going for something else. Maybe they were gonna try to get uh, more sensitive data, uh, but so far as they can tell, none of that stuff was compromised. Hmm. That's a good point, and I hadn't thought of that. Uh, one thing I did think of is whenever someone as important to the military as FireEye gets hacked, they're probably going to be forced to lie about what was really stolen. So yes, it may well be that they did get something else, but they aren't allowed to publicly reveal what they got. 
one thought I had was that what would make sense, and I mean, this is just totally out of left field, but one thing that came, that occurred to me was a possibility of um, like sort of a supply chain attack type scenario where, uh, you know, maybe they were trying to get a hold of these tools and then with the, with the idea that they could modify them and then somehow uh, receive the bad tools out there for um, employees or contractors to use against uh, sensitive targets. So that was a thought that I had. Well, of course, another, another positive thinking thing is they plan to steal more, but FireEye was so effectively got caught before they got too far. Yeah, well, that was one of the idea. Well, that was one of the one thing that was posited um, deep in this article somewhere. So yeah, well, you know, we really don't know. You never do get too much information about these things, and they certainly can't yeah. tell you how they got in. That's the kind of information that they aren't going to be in a hurry to tell us. Yeah, but this and the other article did mention that it was they used some kind of super novel surprising attack, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, and you know, other people just say they used advanced attacks to make it sound like they're less stupid, but when FireEye says it, I imagine they know what they're talking about. Yeah, though, a lot of the time, too, they will try to make it sound advanced, and it was obvious that it was some super basic old-school attack that they should have been able to defend against, but not in this case. Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to work on FireEye. But, that, you know, of course, one thing uh, some of my friends think is that you know, this means we're not safe or they must be a bad company, but nobody's safe. Everybody can get hacked. Yeah. There, yeah. And that's, that's the thing. There's nothing you can buy that will really stop a nation state attacker. All you can do is stop like right. criminals. <laughs> right. Right. And, and I mean, even then, like you can't even stop every petty criminal, uh, you know, out there. So I, I mean, I, and I think like they're, they're, I think it's definitely the wrong takeaway for um, people to say, oh, well, they're just a crappy company. Um, because like you said, this can happen to anyone. Yeah, and I really like FireEye. I got two whole courses based on their material. I, as far as I can tell, FireEye is really the world leader in instant response. So if they get hacked, it, it doesn't mean they're a crappy company. It just means defense is really hard. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I like that everybody I've seen has said the same thing, which is don't freak out. This is not like wanna cry. When the NSA right. plates were used to make a really dangerous worm, what they stole is not that important. And um, I saw an, an angry malware Jake tweet on Twitter saying, somebody who calls himself an expert and says this is as bad as want to cry is an idiot. And yes, this is a subtweet. And I don't know who said that, but apparently somebody said that. But everybody I've seen has said the same thing I said, that, you know, this doesn't look like they got anything too important, no zero days. And FireEye burned all their tools. They released all the indicators of compromise for their tools so people can protect themselves from it. So they really seem to have correctly responded to this. And that's all you can do. Everybody attacked. The real quality of a company is how do you respond? Yeah, mm -hmm. and so far as we know, and so far as they've reported, the attackers didn't get any sensitive uh, client data, which is is would be the real um, that would be the real uh, scary part, you know, if they did. So. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Red team tools are a pretty mild thing to lose, really. Yeah. It just means that FireEye has to spend some money generating new red team tools. Right. Yeah. All right. And then Urban. Ah, Windows 10 on ARM. Just last week, I saw them saying there's going to be no Windows 10 on ARM. So what's the deal? So there is. <laughs> it, you can get it through the Insider program. Oh. Uh, yeah. So I was trying to get it uh, earlier today. Apparently, you have to have a Windows box first in order to get this thing. But anyway, it, they are building it. It's in their preview build. Oh. But it is possible to now start running 64-bit applications within a Windows 10 on ARM. So is Microsoft going to make, going to sell this and put it on ARM, or is it just for the Mac? No, this is for uh, selling. Right now, it's in the preview stage. So they're going to sell it, and then they're going to have ARM-based Windows laptops? Yeah, that's what it looks like. Well, you know, I've been hearing people, I was on the, the um, Security Now podcast, um, Leo Laporte said he got the Mac ARM and he said, this thing is wonderful. It is so fast. The browser is so fast. You got to get one. This thing is great. So I don't know. The, I'm hearing that. It's not all the people whining that, like we were saying before, there's not versatile enough. Apparently it's got benefits. That it Mac is, on the ARM. So. This is not a hundred percent because like we can't run, at least as far as I know, we can't run uh, Unix binaries on it. 
you can't emulate. Uh, so like, for example, uh, from what I was reading, like the, the rainbow crack thing project that I'm working on, yeah. none, of, none of those binaries could work on ARM. Well, yeah, I think the problem always when you make a big change like this is the legacy code takes a while to catch up. But they explained, I heard, a, a, I think it was the same thing security now, he said, the Intel emulation is incredibly fast because they altered the ARM, our hardware architecture to be closer to the Intel architecture for just this reason. So that the translation of ARM by, of Intel binaries to ARM binaries running code that runs very fast, often 100% as fast as if it was an Intel processor, they say. Mm -hmm. So they, they say their, their Intel compatibility tool is very impressive, but I know you cannot run like VMware on it yet. Anyway. Yeah, yeah so, so that's coming. That, that looks like it's going to, uh, emulation is coming to Windows 10. But of course, if Windows was on ARM, then no Windows software would run, right? Unless it was recompiled for ARM. Well, uh, unless it runs on this thing. They're basically their version of Rosetta. But does it, is it Windows on ARM that emulates Intel? Yes. Oh. Yes. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's basically their version of Rosetta. Oh, so you could put this on a Mac. Maybe. That'd be interesting. I'm I'm totally down with with ARM based PCs, but as long as we have a standard, it either has to be all Intel, all ARM. None of this. Some of our computers are ARM. Some of our computers are Intel, and they're just not compatible with each other. Well, this is why we have to have diversity and competition. Here you are making a monolithic monopoly again. <laughs> <laughs> we just need like ten different kinds of processors. Then we'll have a free market, right? No standards. That's. <laughs> Oh, you can go for disaster. What could go wrong? Yeah. yeah. How could go wrong? That's right. <laughs> well, anyway, we'll see. Maybe I'll have to get one of those Macs, but I'm not in a hurry just yet. Anyway, Kerberos bronze bit. Right. So you, you've heard of the golden ticket. I have. You heard of the silver ticket. Now we have the well, here's, here's third place. <laughs> it's what? called the bronze bit attack. <laughs> um, and it's essentially very similar to those those attacks, but much less powerful. Um, the idea is that if you have a user password hash that's used to encrypt a key that's associated with a service, uh, you can use that that user session key to unlock the forwarding um, bit, and then you can forward that that service key. It, it's Almost useful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I like I like I like the uh, cartoons. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> well, okay. So it gives you access to one service. Pretty much. Yeah. It's, under it's pretty definitely, specific conditions. Yeah, under very specific conditions, you can kind of get access to a single service. Congratulations. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, I, think I mean, it is impressive though. I think one thing about all this is Kerberos is getting pretty old. Yeah. I wonder when we're going to come up with something better than Kerberos. It seems to have a lot of these strange flaws. Anyway. All right. And then, uh, yeah, I thought this was important. I, I came across this yesterday on Twitter. So Dragos has got 110 million. And what they do is ICS, Industrial Control System Security. And they're funded by the Saudi oil company and such. And you know, it's really a big deal. And the 110 million Series C funding, their point is it's really coming of age. Industrial equipment security, largely based on the same thing that sort of got me involved in Saudi Arabia is that the Russians are hacking the oil refineries there and trying to get people killed. And uh, I, I, was, I agree with it. I think it's very industrial container security is really important. And he actually addressed the issue that his company like mine, was one of the few willing to do business in, in Saudi Arabia, even though it's politically incorrect. And he had an argument just like mine. Maybe people think it's rotten, but he said, you know, I don't feel like telling him because your government's bad, I won't have anything to do with you. You know, I especially don't feel that way in America right now. Like I say, oh, no, I can't do business with anyone with a bad government. But anyway, he said, you know, just because I disagree with the politics of your government doesn't mean I'm not a little tell factory workers that they can't have safe equipment. But anyway... Um, I'm glad to see ICS security being taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really need an industry leader there because ICS is lagging way behind like IoT. 
just ridiculous things being wrong. And nobody can ever update that stuff. So it's like uh, infrastructure in a hospital and such. So anyway, there may be some improvements coming out of that. And Huawei, oh, AI software. Oh, neat. Yeah, this is really gross. Yeah. Uh, um, this is disgusting and uh, definitely very, very dystopian. Um, so a Uyghur alarm, yeah. holy cow. Yeah, uh, essentially the way this uh, facial recognition works and it's better, they, uh, they started testing this two years ago already, which is really messed up. Uh, but essentially the way this works is it's an AI enabled, uh, I should say machine learning enabled camera system that uh, essentially allows them to scan faces in a crowd for people's uh, age, sex, race, ethnicity, what have you, and then uh, trigger trigger alerts to the police, which is, again, you know, what could go wrong here? And this is why it's kind of extra disgusting that uh, Google's firing uh, <laughs> ethical AI researchers for speaking out about racial bias in these systems. It's like, come on, now more than ever, we really need people uh, fighting that good fight. I think everyone pretty much recently backed away from a, from facial recognition systems in like six months ago, saying they're gonna to make too much political trouble. A lot of major companies backed off. And yeah, I think but it's still, it's still going on. Um, and, and I mean, there's, I, there, it, it's disturbing in that I, I think that, um, I mean, there, yeah, when I took a, the, the last flight that I took, the last flight that I took back to the United States in January, um, the boarding system w relied on uh, facial recognition and there was no way to opt out of it. Right. And, and uh, I'm surprised the U.S. government didn't buy this for Trump's Muslim ban. I mean, we have exactly the same kind of politics here. Well, we don't know that they didn't, really. Yeah. Uh, we don't know uh, what, you know, how, how this may be uh, implemented in American policing. Um, there have been some pretty disturbing things coming out of uh, the way that uh, of, of the policing techniques leveraged uh, during the protests this year. So I remember they did have like cops surveilling all the mosques and taking pictures of everybody that went in. Uh, that was about five years ago. Yes. Um, and now they're, the cops are using unmanned drones yeah. uh, that have very, I mean, the, that can be used along with uh, facial recognition systems. Like this, this is pretty messed up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I mean, we do the, have the Fourth Amendment that's supposed to protect people, but people seem to be just ignoring it for the last yeah. several years. Welcome to the uh, digital panopticon. Yeah. Yeah. So there's your dose of dystopia for Friday. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And uh, cloud privacy first web analytics. That seems like a contradiction in terms. How does this work? So it's supposed to key, uh, let you know who's visiting your site or what, what pages in your site without keeping uh, uh, PII. And you don't have to use Cloudflare as your, your DNS in order to do this. So what do you get about them? What kind of demographic? Uh, so you get, you get track of like where it's coming from. You get some basic information. Yeah, I kind of like the picture that they had up above. So you kind of see how many page views, how many visits. So if you have a number of pages, you can slip their little JavaScript code. But you usually need to know their location and you'd like to know their age and sex and everything else. Uh, apparently it's not going to tell you that part, but it'll tell you like what country it's coming from. Country. Okay. Refer yeah. browser device type. Well, yeah, but you know, at face, as Facebook would tell you, the real money is in knowing a lot more. Like how rich are they? How educated are they? How likely are they to buy a pickup truck or a, a pack of cigarettes? That's how you make the money is knowing that kind of information. Yeah. So, I, that's where the privacy part comes in. Yeah. I'm not telling you that part. 
about your your visitors? Well, it will be interesting to see how much people want this. I know um, things like DuckDuckGo are based on the idea that you can just go back to untargeted advertising. And I think they're probably wrong about that. I think the genie's out of the bottle. I think targeted advertising is worth a lot more to the advertisers than untargeted advertising. But uh, we're living through the uh, competition to determine that. Yep. Yeah. And the yeah, other is tar pit. Oh, tar pits are good, clean fun. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> I thought this was a lot of fun. Uh, someone wrote a, a script or a program. Oh, they used make. So it was definitely a program uh, to uh, essentially make it so when you try to log into SSH, it, you'll get the banner. You know, you'll, they'll put in the password and then it'll just kind of hang. Yeah. And a lot of these scripts like have no idea what to do <laughs> and just sit there for like days at a time <laughs> waiting for the server, so completely stopping these attacks, um, assuming they're not multi-threaded, but at least one thread's being, uh, being halted. Uh, um, and they'll sit there and, and this, what's surprising is you might think, oh, you might get two or three sitting there. This person apparently had thousands of these bots <laughs> connected to, to, to the machine, uh, just sitting there waiting for a response from the SSH server. So you can just litter these all over the internet. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I mean, it would be easy enough to, to bypass if you know you're looking for them, but. Yep. Well, then you just have to vary them. Yeah, it's a cute idea. You could extend this into a lot of fun things for like a CGF yeah. or something. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of have an idea for a, a, an SSH server that uh, will give a command prompt, but anything you type just goes into the either <laughs> and just yeah. collects all the, all, the, um, uh, all the commands that they're trying to run. You know, uh, another fun one might be one that garbles everything, so everything is spelled wrong, and you think you typed it wrong, and you try typing it again. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you can mess with people. I knew a guy that ran a server, and he gave people accounts, and if they abused it, then he would turn it into a tar pit and irritate you. you know? Yeah. And so this one I thought was pretty important, just like the email services over here. There are a few of them, so they had an end-to-end -end encrypted email called Tutonota in Germany. And the court ordered them to hand over the emails. So they have a limited period of time and they are ordered to create a hacking tool and hack in. This is what Apple resisted when the FBI ordered them to do the same thing. And ultimately the case was dropped, but Apple said, we are not gonna hack into our own end-to-end -end encryption for you. Um, there was Hushmail did hack into the end-to-end -end encryption when they got a court order. They put a Trojan on the website that would steal your passwords so you get into the end-to-end -end encryption. And these guys are now under court order to do the same thing. So that's crazy. It is. Now I know the email service that Snowden used shut down when they got an international security letter like this. And then the court ruled, well, you might have shut down, but you still have to hand over Snowden's emails. Just going out of business does not mean you're released from the order to hand over the emails. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's uh, you know, one of the scary things in the, uh, the crypto backdoor thing. And of course, the problem is this means if any government in the world makes this, then you have to do it, right? So how can anybody offer an email service that goes around the world if they want to have security, if they're going to have to breach the security in response to every government that might ask for it? That's why it's kind of a, a, a real interesting case. But anyway, they haven't done it yet, but I think they are going to be forced to do it by German law. So we'll see what happens here. What about what's going to happen to Proton, Proton Mail then? Is Proton Mail end to end encrypted? Yes, yes. I would imagine they are vulnerable to the same thing. Uh, maybe they should proactively block all the users in Germany. They're, right. Yeah. Yeah. They're, I think they're in Switzerland, but it's like German, a lot of Germans who work at that company. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what else you could do. I mean, you'd say if we, do traffic with German customers, we may be compelled to break our end-to-end -end encryption, so we cannot offer service there. That might be, I don't know what we'll do. That's why it really is important. And this is why the uh, the crypto wars go on. The cryptographers keep saying, you really can't do this. And if you do this anywhere, it shatters the whole system like glass, which it kind of does. Right. And then like when we start talking about VPNs, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. How's that going to go? Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting issue. Now, Cloudflare, I know, has developed some really clever ways to add a 
pipeline to one location that's encrypted without be using the same encryption as the rest of your service. And that might be another thing they could do here. They could use a special weaker tunnel to going just to Germany and warn the Germans that your stuff is less encrypted than everybody else's. I don't know. But then it would compromise anybody who exchanges emails to anybody in Germany. It's just kind of a mess. So we'll see what comes of that. And uh, yeah, there's Rebecca Jones. There were a bunch of links about Rebecca Jones here. Did we lose Liz? We lost Liz. Let's yeah. skip yeah. ahead. Okay, we'll skip ahead. I'll come back to her. When Liz returns to life, the holiday hack challenge. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, this is the third year running. I love this conference. So I uh, put it out there. Yeah. For our, our viewers, if they want to do some hacking stuff, this is another great opportunity for them to play. It has, uh, this year, that it's actually a little better. And not only is it more expanded, so you, you're not as crowded as the years before, but they, they're telling you which, uh, uh, which events are harder, which ones are easier, so you can gauge yourself. Good. And it had, this one has like little videos you watch of security talks and then challenges related to them, right? Yep. Yep. So it's, it's good for beginners. It can be, right? Yeah. It's good for beginners and it's good for veterans. Yeah, I should. That's good. I, I've i got a consulting job taking up my time, but, you know, I might be interested. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing this as soon as work finishes. Yep. Yep. Well, that's good. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Then we got uh, SpaceX. Yeah, so there was a fun explosion uh, this week. Uh, SpaceX launched a rocket. It went up. Uh, it looked to have some is issues in the ascent, and then it came down, and it was it positioned itself to land. And oh, let's watch the video. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. here it comes. It's landing. It's coming down for a landing. Here it comes. Oh, I saw some people so, making fun of it. I didn't know it was real. It what? was absolutely real, and afterwards they posted this message on the stream saying, congratulations on the test, great job, huge success. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Well, I mean, and, and it is a test, so if, even if it does blow up, that's still a success. <laughs> but it was just hilarious. I'm not it landed, it just didn't land in one piece. I mean, if, if the fact that they got it off the ground is an accomplishment. That's just full stop. Okay. A highly uh, dubious accomplishment if it blows up. I don't know. Right, but yeah, the fact that after it blew up and it, had, it was just there was nothing left at the landing pad. It was just complete rubble, and uh, you know they just said congratulations, job well done. And yeah, that everyone. Yeah. You know, I went to a thing called the Future Expo like 25 years ago in San Francisco, and this guy was there with his hover car. So he had this model hover car powered by like a vacuum cleaner. And he had these Barbie dolls in it, like eight Barbie dolls sitting in a circle. And he turned it on. There was whole crowd was around. And it came up, it hovered up, it went over, and then it turned upside down and went <laughs> right into the ground and smashed the Barbie dolls. And everybody was like stunned. And he was like, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. It was pretty amazing. <laughs> like, I'm never going to get that thing. Yeah. So that's, uh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess he's going to have to build another one, huh? I, I imagine so. Like I said, it was a test rocket. It wasn't going to go on any production system anyway. It did was SpaceX just send those people up to the uh, the space station a couple of weeks. They ago? did. This is a new rocket they're testing. Something called oh, I think the rocket, right? Yeah, this, the ST eight or something. The um, so that one works. But yeah, their other rockets work fine. This one, this one will work fine. I mean, it seemed like a lot of the stuff went well. Uh, during the test, uh, it was just an issue with some of the engine pressure, I think. That's what it looked like anyway. Okay, well, I guess they have got to go back to the growing board. Anyway, Liz, are you back? Or are you frozen up again? Ah, good. So you're talking about this woman, Rebecca Jones. I'm actually here, yes. Uh, yes, this mess, messy slew of links is uh, yeah. uh, uh, this ongoing story that uh, I've been following that's pretty interesting. And the one you found was pretty good too at the end. Yeah. Uh, but the, essentially uh, the, gist of the, the gist of it is was there was this uh, uh, researcher working for the state and she uh, wasn't um, repeating the party line that everything's fine. Uh, with the flames in the background. And so uh, they started, first they fired her um, back in the summer when she refused to uh, lie 
uh, that that COVID wasn't a problem, and then um, and then she uh, <laughs> then she uh, they they have up to have leveled up on their harassment com campaign against her, and put together this pretty flimsy uh, premise that they were that she had sent out some mess uh, some unauthorized message through over a um uh emergency alert system in the state um and uh, essentially sent a bunch of armed cops to raid her house and arrest her and they hauled their whole family out at gunpoint and made these crazy threats and uh then one one of the articles which I thought was interesting was they were telling her to calm down. Like you know, what scientist isn't going to be flustered when confronted with a a SWAT team at their door pointing guns at their family? Like yes, calm down, crazy lady. How dare you be upset by that? Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, one of the most interesting and takes on it was when they actually uh, started talking to security people <laughs> about this uh, because the premise is pretty bad. The, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ev evidence that they used to get the search warrants pretty weak. Um, basically, they based it all off of uh, her, off of the IP address that was used, which, you know, it's not like you can spoof an IP address with trivial, that it's trivial to do that. So um, it was pretty weak. I mean, it is pretty weak. I find it unlikely that someone would, who knew the system well enough to know that this person was a scientist that they could use, you know, and they had their IP address and they would specifically, like if this was some random person's house and, and they got arrested for doing this, um, I would say, yeah, it was probably spoofing. Uh, but the fact that that this person is a, you know, works for, you know, w works in this department, has expertise in the field, and you know, a, you know, has a motivation, and that the um, the IP came from her house, you know, is is suggestive, at the very least. I mean, it's not hard rock evidence. But it is. If it was UDP then the IP address is easy to spoof. If it's TCP, yeah. it's not that easy to spoof. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and it could have been anyone on their network, for sure. Uh, and it, it totally doesn't mean it was her specifically. It could have been anyone. Um, but to, but yeah, I, I don't think it's it's as flimsy as, you know, but it definitely is not rock solid. Well, there's another part of it, of course, which is that everybody in the whole state in the system uses the same username and password and they never change it. Right. No. So it's not her use of her password doesn't prove anything. Right. Yeah. So like I said, you would have to know, uh, you, you would have to specifically really be targeting her. If, if it was someone else or someone outside the house, you would have to know who she is. Um, and, you know, and specifically like try to blame her to use her IP. Uh, cause if it was just some random person who got the, who got it, they would just go to Starbucks well, and use a Starbucks IP. I mean, she did incur the wrath of the uh, she did incur the wrath of the governor and a lot all sorts of other government officials. So it's I mean it's it does seem like there's motivation on the other side to uh, to pull a frame job here as well. So well, another thing I saw is one of the um, people involved said that they shouldn't have raided her, and in fact, if everything that the, the people in this lawsuit, if everything you're accusing her of is true, I would give her a medal for being a hero. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's not so much like, I, I think that she, honestly, if the IP is coming from the house, it was probably someone in her house that, that did it. But um, the response was ridiculous. You don't send guns because someone logged in and sent a funny message. We did that at City College. Someone sent a funny message uh, a few months ago about Cloud Hall being on fire. You know, it's mm -hmm. not that big of a deal. You don't send the cops. You don't send oh, guns. Yeah, I mean, this, that's, that's one issue. I mean, she, yeah. um, 
So there's not, you can argue about the IP address, but I think you can also argue that what she's done is not wrong. Apparently what she's done is just published the truth about the COVID statistics, and now she's getting them from insider whistleblowers, and that's who they're trying to intimidate, is the people well, inside that are leaking stuff to her. Another thing is I'm, I would be interested to see uh, what the chain of custody was on this evidence, because that's a pretty easy thing to manipulate and tamper with. Um, yeah, I think one thing is, as from a technical network engineer point of view, Caitlin and I are thinking the IP address is pretty good evidence, but I think what the EFF kind of people are saying is it's pretty easy to raise probable doubt about it in uh, court. Yeah, and I don't think this would hold up in, in court. Um, as far as probability goes, I think it's probable. I mean, if, if just given who she is, you know, if the, if if they like I said, if they thought that this was coming from an eighty-year-old woman's house who had no didn't even know what Corona was, you know, obviously someone probably just hacked into her network or something. But the fact that this was someone really in the game, and um, you know, would have had the access and tools and knowledge to put this out and the motivation, I mean, it's it's painting a picture. Um, yeah, at least my mind. But this, I think, is the really important thing. She didn't do anything wrong. All she did was right. send a message telling people, if you've seen illegal things, please tell the truth about it and blow the whistle. Don't let people get away with it. And they say, that's not a bad thing to say. That's yeah. not some huge harm being done. Yeah, no, no. I mean, and like I said, I, I've seen, I've seen quote unquote worse and it's not a big deal to, to message. Yeah, I, it does certainly make the government seem really guilty. Like they're trying to hide their crimes and use unnecessary harshness to intimidate people yeah. into being quiet about their criminal activity. Yeah. So and the other that, thing is, too, she's denied it over and over again. And I expect her, her uh, lawyers would counsel her just to not say anything at all. Um, yeah, well, that's where I think her history comes into it. She doesn't sound like someone that takes advice very much. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is a, it's also curious, too, if uh, everyone's got the same user name and password, then, uh, you know, we come into um, sort of like the case that's being um, heard by the Supreme Court right now um, surrounding the CFAA, uh, you know, did, did, was, that, was that access really unauthorized? You know, did she... Um, you know, it, maybe she uh, made somebody mad doing it, but do, you know, is there a, was there a clear breach of proto protocol? And if so, is there a clear crime that's been committed here? It really sounds like they made enough mistakes that they're going to have to throw this out of court if she gets a reasonable lawyer. Yeah, and I mean, it's. I, I can see where there would be some motivation to throw this woman under the bus. Yeah, well, she's a whistleblower. Like, the authority figures always hate you, and they just want you yeah. to shut up. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, making an example of this one uh, definitely sends a message to successive scientists that have the uh, misfortune to accept a job with the state. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And it kind of reminds me of the other big news this week, of course, the approval of the coronavirus vaccine. And I really agree with what I was hearing. It's really glad that they had good that they had like 16 non-government experts examine the evidence because we really can't trust what comes out of the CDC or the uh, any government health services right now. They've all been pretty thoroughly corrupted by political pressure. So it's really good that we have outside people that confirm that the virus, uh, the vaccine is okay. I, I also think it's sort of telling that uh, the um, Attorney General hasn't filed any charges yet after this grand raid uh where they seized all of her stuff um yeah. which you know usually if they if the cops get a warrant like that and they bust in and steal all your stuff charges are going to be cut forthcoming pretty quick uh because it's essentially they've got really strong probable cause at that point um and basically they're just grabbing the confirmation to file the case but that's not it's not happening in this case, which makes me a little curious. I like this one. The judge was just sworn in, and this was his first act ever to sign this warrant. So <laughs> this this is just the governor, you know, doing something reckless and foolish. 
and skipping yeah. past the uh, the steps of due process, and that doesn't hold up in court when you do things like that. Yeah, well, especially suspect that it was an appointed judge, not an elected one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is. Yeah, this, is, this this smells this smells rotten. <laughs> yeah, and I, one thing I'm amazed, like with the election debacle, all the experts are saying trust the courts. The courts aren't going to let this nonsense happen, and that appears to be true. The courts are still maintaining their integrity pretty well. You can't go to court with a ridiculous pile of horrible mess and get away with it. They will say, wait a minute, you have to obey the law in court, which is what I was hoping. <laughs> yeah, so our, a lot of parts of our society seem to be failing, but not the courts so much. Anyway, I think that's it. Any more comments? Nope. Nope. All right. Well, 